All right, thank you. Um, my name's Eric. I'm a designer with a company called ThoughtBot. I'm also the uh, a maintainer of the A11Y project, and I'm also um, too loud on Twitter, but I figured I could just jump right on in. Thank you to everyone for attending. So, hey, it's the internet. Heck yeah. We've got web surfing, cool dogs, cat memes, chatting with your friends, watching videos, and whatever this is, everything is awesome when you're online. Or is it? Before we get started, there are two things I'd like to cover. First is a content warning for this talk. The nature of this talk's content means I will be discussing some pretty terrible things. The list is domestic abuse, drug abuse, genocide, harassment, racism, stalking, school shooting, and swatting. I will only be touching on the concepts described in this list lightly to prove a point, with the exception of school shootings, genocide, and harassment in that order. I'll need to provide more detail for these three topics in order to better articulate points I want to make about how to avoid them. If this talk's content is something you don't think you're in a good place to listen to, I completely understand. Uh, the talks by Pretty Plum and Jack and Wilco and Mary Jo are also happening at this time slot, and they both look great. I'll also be posting this talk, including annotations and links after it is concluded, if you feel like this is something you want to consume at your own pace. The second thing I'd like to call attention to is that I'm not the first person to be discussing the concept of subverted design, and hopefully not the last. A lot of the research for this talk is built from the painstakingly assembled information created by women working in our industry or web adjacent technology industries. I would also like to say that finding people who have discussed this topic was difficult. I attribute part of that to survivor bias, the logical error that teaches us that we overlook what isn't present as part of our selection process. It is my belief that many who could talk about this are no longer here, having left or having been forced out of the industry. The goal of today's talk is to equip you, the audience, on how to identify subverted design and guard against it. The beats I'll be hitting on for today's talk are what isn't subverted design, how subverted design can ruin a product, subverted design in the headlines, how subverted design is our responsibility, and how to identify where subverted design could occur. I might be biased, but I think inclusive design is a really great framework for a lot of design-related things. The reason for this is that the nature of inclusivity requires thinking about how people can get left out and be discriminated against. Things like equality, accessibility, and fairness are really important, but we need to acknowledge the reason inclusive design even exists in the first place is because we oftentimes accidentally or intentionally create the opposite. As a methodology, inclusive design allows us to take an idea and see how we can facilitate or hinder access. And this talk is very much in the spirit of that. So now let's describe what subverted design is not. Defining these more commonly understood parameters helps to give us a framework for what does and what does not qualify as subverted design. First off, subverted design is not bad design. On this slide is a web page with a bright rainbow background and a marquee banner that reads, Accept Jesus Forever Forgiven Church. It inexplicably features a passage from Romans 623, a background MIDI, a hot air balloon, a World War II fighter plane, a dove, some arches, a stepladder, and a banner ad for maverickchristians.com. This uh, prismatic vomit is a rather extreme example, 
but it is honestly pretty direct about its intentions, and there is little room for doing anything other than the six or so calls of action it wants you to undertake. Subverted design is also not what I like to call beholden design. Remember in the before times when we could go to the theater and spend our hard-earned money to watch a movie? And that how, despite paying for this service, you would still be forced to watch some advertisements before the thing you actually wanted to watch was shown to you. That's an example of beholden design. It's where a person enters into a system and is forced to endure something that benefits the system to ultimately get what they want. Speaking of systems, subverted design isn't hacking. This is a little bit more subtle than the previous examples. Hacking is where someone breaks a system on a deeper level, typically by finding an exploit in code and using that exploit to gain access and exert control on the underlying systems that power the experience. Subverted design also isn't a dark pattern, although they're close cousins. If you're not familiar, a dark pattern is a technique where a website or app deliberately uses a confusing user experience to trick you into doing things you didn't intend to. For the example displayed here, Sports Direct has automatically added a product to your shopping cart and charges you for it, hoping that you won't notice when you go to check out. Gross. So now you might be thinking that these are just one-offs and that I'm really grasping at straws here. Um, what I say back is that we should not be so quick to underestimate what people are capable of doing with the resources we give them. In design, there is the bias that our users are simple and require straightforward instruction, oftentimes to the point where we infantilize them. What I'm telling you is that even a less digitally literate user may be able to subvert a system provided there's enough motivation on their part. Here's an example of people figuring out that they could get free burgers from a McDonald's self-serve kiosk by customizing an order to a ridiculous degree. It's a funny example, but the real fault here is the designers and developers who didn't anticipate the logic behind their rules for order customization being taken to an extreme. So what exactly is subverted design then? Now that we have some solid examples of what it isn't, I'd like to tell you a story that illustrates an example of what it could be. This isn't something I've made up. It was a potential client we were considering working with at my job. What I'm going to discuss here is how a poorly thought out system can be taken advantage of by someone with malicious intentions. To do this, we'll be breaking the system down into discrete components to show how components relate to each other and rely on each other and where that can all fall apart under stress. This is a school. Schools are effectively a collection of classrooms, each classroom containing a teacher and their students. In a school's organization, there is an admin staff that the teachers answer to. This is a simplified version of things, but for the sake of this talk, let's say that this is the principal. This is a school shooter. If you're not from the United States, this is a horrifically common thing that we've normalized. A school shooter could be a student or an adult either working in the school or who enters into it. In a school shooting scenario, a, target, a shooter may target a classroom. Nearby teachers will become aware of this once the shooting starts. These teachers will reach out to emergency response services, typically via text or phone call from their smartphone. Because again, this is America and we've normalized this horror to the point where we need to train our teachers for this for kind of formally unthinkable scenario. Each emergency response service can then take this reported information and push it out to the school staff, including other teachers in the school, as well as other associated emergency response services. This allows both teachers and school admin, as well as emergency response services, to become aware of the situation and act on information as the crisis unfolds. However, one big problem is that this is real life and real life is messy. Things aren't as straightforward as the scenario I just described. 
In addition to reaching out to emergency services, teachers will reach out to family members, fellow coworkers, friends, and loved ones. And to add to this complexity, emergency services are constantly communicating each with each other as new information is made known. Friends, family, and loved ones may also try to reach out to teachers, students, and school admin when they learn about what is happening. In addition, local and national media may also try to butt in. This creates a ton of chaos in an already chaotic, high-stakes situation. With it comes increased chances for out-of-date information or bad information to be disseminated. To add to this, too much communication happening too quickly in a small area can cause the whole thing to crash. To address the issue, the potential client had the idea that they could focus their efforts on a single individual. In this case, it would be the principal or other high-level school official. In the event of a shooting, teachers would be instructed to not pass information along to emergency services and instead all notify a central figure. The idea being that the central figure could communicate with emergency officials on their behalf. Emergency services would then coordinate with each other as well as disseminate information back to the school in one single consolidated transmission. In theory, this would streamline communication to keep bad information down as well as helping to keep the network up. In practice, however, they failed to think like a villain. An attacker who gets control of a teacher's phone now has a one-stop shop for accessing information about other teachers, students, and emergency services. It lets them know all sorts of information that would make an already terrible situation worse. If they get control of the school administrator's phone, it gets even more dangerous. Using the client's proposed feature set, they could send messaging to both emergency services and school staff. Messages that could, for example, corral staff, declare false alerts and all clears, and facilitate taunting, goading, and other forms of psychological manipulation. It also failed to anticipate a scenario where there were multiple coordinated attackers, a situation that has tragically happened before on multiple occasions. After a full review of the proposal, we were able to determine that a school shooter could potentially get access to the school floor plan, teacher names, teacher locations, teacher status, student names, student locations, student status, incoming police, incoming emergency services, and messaging. Identifying the various ways this product could be subverted translated into the very real risk for harm to be amplified. This discovery represented a hard stop on the progress of a product that had already had tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of development time poured into it. On this slide is a panel from a golden age comic depicting a sports car that's crashed into a tree placed at a fork in the road. The school shooting reporting app is one example, but this subversion of technology for personal purpose has been happening for quite some time now and will continue to happen. If you start to look for this kind of thing, you will see it everywhere. In the Washington Post, women face new form of harassment on Metro, airdrop. In the New York Times, thermostats, locks and lights, digital tools of domestic abuse. In News Hub, Auckland woman creeped out after restaurant worker uses her contact tracing details to hit on her. In The Verge, Twitter bans animated PNG files after online attackers targeted users with epilepsy. In The Daily Dot, Facebook is helping husbands brainwash their wives with targeted ads. In BuzzFeed News, Instagram's opioid recovery hashtags are full of drug dealers. In The Verge, swatting over Call of Duty game results in deadly police shooting of Kansas man. I keep a list of these headlines as I run across them. And part of creating this talk was whittling this list down to a length that could 
prove my point without running over time or completely shutting you, the audience, down. But I do need to stress that this is happening and that it is widespread. As technology enters into more and more of our daily lives, there are more and more chances for this subversion to happen. It also means the scope of harm gets exponentially worse, culminating in this. Myanmar military personnel use Facebook's features to orchestrate an ethnic cleansing of a minoritized population. This is genocide facilitated by technological subversion. Don't look away. We need to stop being naive or this will continue to happen. Design finally got a seat at the table. And you know what? That's great. However, this also means the scope of our job has expanded. We're no longer people who just make pretty things. We now help shape how businesses operate in the world. With this new set of responsibilities comes the uncomfortable understanding that we may not be the heroes we thought we were. Historically, there's been this notion that we fight for the user's best interests and be the first line of defense for guarding them online. But realistically, design is now mainly a profession that uses aesthetic and usability best practices to help businesses more efficiently generate profit. This shift is worth acknowledging for many reasons, but the one I'd like to focus on for this talk is the vacuum that this creates and how one of the many things that can enter into this gap is a higher likelihood for harm. On this slide is a comic panel depicting an ecstatic man in a suit half submerged in a bag of money completely oblivious to the sinister hand reaching out for him. We need to understand that we're still pretty new at thinking about how to prevent harm, but others in the tech industry have been doing it for some time now. We can look to the field of information security, for example, which has been practicing threat modeling for quite some time. Threat modeling is the process of identifying all the parts that make up a system, and how they relate to each other. With the knowledge of what the parts that make up the system are and how they operate, we are then able to compartmentalize them and control who has access to what. This proactively limits the amount of harm an attacker can inflict on a system. Any feature can be abused. The gist of this talk is wisdom from Kat Fakui, senior product designer for communities at GitHub. I greatly admire and have benefited from Kat's work, and you'd be smart to read more of what she's written. So we now know that harm happens because of a naive view of technology, that people can exploit systems if sufficiently motivated, and that we need to consider both the systems we work on and the component pieces they're made from. In order to fight monsters, we must become monsters. It's time to be the villain. This is our origin moment, our tragic backstory, our chance to seize control and show the world what we're made of. Threat modeling is a great starting point for thinking about how to prevent subverted design, but we're villains now, resourceful, relentless, radical. We need to formulate bigger, bolder plans. I think that turning to the inclusive design principles is a great way to start. If you are unfamiliar, they are seven principles that, if followed, help to make accessible digital experiences. Remember, it's not all sunshine and rainbows and kittens. This is a methodology to take an idea and see how it can facilitate or hinder access. The first inclusive design principle of pro providing a comparable experience teaches us that content can be accessed in multiple ways that people can accomplish tasks in a way that suits their needs without undermining the quality of the content. Examples of this include alternate image content and synchronized captions. As villains, we can flip this. My first flipped inclusive design principle is to force a single path. This opens up opportunities for exploitation. 
For example, needing to rely on someone else to read the content for you requires a huge extension of trust. Think banking, medical records, mental health services, legal information, and all other kinds of sensitive data. What happens when this kind of trust gets broken? The second inclusive design principle of considering situation tells us to ensure our content works in a, vari in a variety of scenarios. First time and experienced users, outdoors and indoors, Wi-Fi and a metered data plan, bright light and low light, etc. Flipping this, my second inverted principle is to ignore circumstance. Demand specific conditions to work and restrict access until they're met. An example of this is requiring someone to be in a specific location in order to work. In controlling the conditions, the system can control how its users behave. This is predatory with the side effect of making users more predictable, which in turn makes them more exploitable. The third inclusive design principle is to be consistent, to use familiar conventions and apply them consistently. Examples of this are buttons, are using buttons that look like the buttons on other websites and links that look like the links on other websites. Then making sure those buttons and links appear consistently on your own site. When I invert it, we act capriciously and create sudden, unannounced, and unanticipated changes in how our experience works. This allows a bad actor to easily trick and trap the unsuspecting. For example, tricking people into dropping out of queues, misdirecting payment, or sending shock content. Giving control places people's needs first and ensures that they are able to interact with content in their preferred way. Examples of this include the ability to scroll via keyboard, stop animation, and zoom in and out of content. The opposite would be removing autonomy. Here, we downplay voluntary interaction, doing things like ignoring express preferences, or automatically triggering actions without consent. The fifth inclusive design principle is to offer choice. This is providing different ways for people to complete tasks, especially tasks that are complex or non-standard. This principle is reflected with things like individual and bulk actions, expanded and condensed data views, and graph and chart views of tabular data. Its opposite would be to limit options, forcing seemingly arbitrary conditions on your users. Here, you restrict things to a single narrow view and utilize user flows that make no external sense. The sixth inclusive design principle is to prioritize content to help users focus on core tasks, features, and information. Here you do things like place the main information prominently, anticipate information before it is needed, and ensure that content loads quickly. When I invert it, it becomes obfuscate purpose, the act of misdirecting and downplaying the actual goals and consequences of action. Examples of this are hiding legal fees, legal gotchas, and other schemes. The final inclusive design principle is to add value. This is the act of weighing the positive impact of new and existing features and how they interrelate. An example of this from the web platform is how new features such as CSS Grid can greatly enhance layout, but still gracefully degrade into a perfectly readable single column layout for browsers that don't support the feature. The flip version of this final principle is to fill with gibberish. Hide important and consequential information behind complicated language, jargon, distracting decoration, and the like. A really good example of this is uh, trying to buy a car. To recap, my seven inverted inclusive design principles are force a single path, ignore circumstance, act capriciously, remove autonomy, limit options, obfuscate purpose, and fill with gibberish. Each of the seven inverted inclusive design principles I just described weaken a quality digital experience. And each one presents an opportunity for someone to capitalize on a system to cause harm. Combined, they create a system that is ripe for subversion. And as villains, we do good to remember this when taking another look at the products we all work on. 
So let's take this out of the abstract and work through an example of how we can identify areas where bad behavior could occur, and importantly, what can be done about it. It's a joke, and the joke is that it is the truth that on a long enough timeline, every product eventually gets a messaging service. In this example, Christina is using a chat widget to ask for help with her service on a cable provider website. The other sadder joke is that on a long enough timeline, messaging services become dating apps. Here, the responding agent says, you're hot, can I call you? While he can't see Christina, he can access her account, which includes information such as her address. He can also search around and find her social media accounts, where she works, and possibly even where she likes to hang out. As to why, maybe he's bored, or angry, or desperate. You can never know. But we can know that in this scenario, he's abusing position, power, and circumstance to put Christina in an incredibly uncomfortable position. When we consider a simplified version of this chat support widget's user flow, only the happy path is considered. A customer asks a question, and either it is answered or clarifying information is requested and delivered, leading to an eventual resolution of the issue. However, when we think like a villain, we can identify areas where both the agent and the customer can act inappropriately and what can be done about it. It's important to note here that issue resolution may not be the end goal in this circumstance and may in fact never come into play. A successful user flow in this context can be where harm is removed. All of this translates into user interface decisions. Adding additional functionality for secondary actions allows us to empower the chat widgets users. Reporting, blocking, and exporting all can help minimize and prevent harm. Reporting logs the incident and notifies someone charged with reviewing the report it generates. Blocking breaks contact and programmatically prevents this agent from being assigned to this customer in the future. And exporting provides an artifact for the user that can persist after the session is ended and the browser tab has been closed. Note that each one of these features represents additional work, especially if things aren't set up on the back end to accommodate these new changes. So it is important to identify and codify these features as early in the process as you can. On this slide is a comic panel featuring astronauts frantically repairing a silver rocket ship that is already in flight. Another really important thing you can do is slowly, gently introduce the idea of subverted design to the organization you work for. By which I mean tackling subverted design head on might not work the way you think it will. People don't like to hear bad news, especially bad news about things they failed to consider on the things they worked on, and especially bad news about how that might hurt people. And then you factor in things like institutional culture, pressure from management, and toxic positivity. On this slide is an illustration showing an ostrich with its head buried in the sand. If you don't ease people into the idea of their work having the potential to create harm, your efforts might blow up in your face. Here's a Twitter conversation between designers Aaron Z. Lewis and Scott Perkett that talks about just that. Aaron says, quote, in light of the latest Facebook scandal, here's my proposal for replacing design sprints, black mirror brainstorms, a workshop in which you create a black mirror episode. The plot must revolve around misuse of your team's product. Pair with Brown Arama's idea of abusability testing, end quote. Here, Aaron is suggesting a role-playing exercise where you take an existing feature that people like and try to subvert it. Scott replies, quote, I frequently ask genuinely earnest questions of teams along these lines while working on ads measurement at Facebook and was considered negative and not a cultural fit. I did so from a stance of experience. Reminder, blind optimism usually leads to bad outcomes, end quote. With his reply, Scott warns about how this kind of proposal has been received in the real world. Scott wasn't wrong despite this alleged negative cultural fit. 
Of its many, many issues, Facebook has enabled people subverting its ad platform to discriminate based on age, gender, race, religion, and other characteristics. Since Facebook has effectively become digital infrastructure, this means it may prevent access at scale to things like jobs, housing, and credit. This redlining is a repetition of racist segregation policies that occur in the physical world. You see, easing people into the idea of subverted design is a matter of framing. On this slide, I've taken the screenshotted conversation between Aaron and Scott and placed a gigantic ornate golden frame around it. Heroes charging in full of righteousness and declaring that someone could abuse something will shut things down, especially if this accusal is hypothetical. Uh, the act immediately challenges personal and organizational ego. And in fact, someone in the organization who has decision-making power could even be actively exploiting the services you're calling attention to. It's a bad thought, but remember, we're the villains now, so we need to think this way. Instead, gather decision makers in a room. The more diverse, the better. The more experience and perspectives, the better. Once assembled, ask them, how could we make this feature terrible? It's a fun exercise. The prompt creates a space where it's safe to come up with ideas about what bad design is without fear of punishment or retaliation. Villains are sneaky. Start with obvious things like ugly design and bad inputs. Then maybe float the idea of poor performance and cryptic error messages. Slowly nudge them towards worse and worse things. Chances are good they'll start to move into exploitative behavior territory on their own. But if they don't, subtly and sneakily suggest it in a casual manner to help guide them towards where you want them to go. With all the suggestions written down on sticky notes, have them sort the ideas into groups and then have them label the groups. And ta-da! Subversion is now one of a few concerns you've all worked together to uncover. Now, the dynamic has shifted. You, the manipulative supervillain puppeteer that you are, have just created a superhero team. This new team has defined what evil is and now knows what that evil will look like, including subversion. With this newfound knowledge, the superhero team will now rally around protecting their users and feel good about doing so, because now they're the ones feeling empowered to set things right. On this slide is a part of a Golden Age comic showing a five-man superhero team who have, dress, who have very serious-looking expressions, but who are also dressed pretty ridiculously. Another really important thing you can do is create a code of conduct for your companies, teams, and projects. Codes of conduct do a really important job. They outline expectations of what is and what is not acceptable behavior. This creates a shared understanding of community norms. It also outlines responsibilities and provides benchmarks for behavioral and ethical standards as well as methods to report bad behavior in a safe and secure way. On this slide is Multiple Man fighting some superheroes. Multiple Man is a supervillain that has the ability to instantly create an infinite amount of copies of himself. The Contributor Covenant Code of Conduct is a code of conduct you'll frequently see on GitHub and many digital projects. The covenant itself makes for a good starting point, but the problem is it is presented as a turnkey solution. You can click a button to drop a copy of the covenant into a project without really knowing what it fully is <clears throat> or why it covers what it covers. Each community has its own specific needs and the code of conduct should be manually reviewed and updated to reflect that. The other important bit about codes of conduct is adopting one isn't the same as internalizing it. We all know we don't read codes of conduct, but really we should. And we should encourage others to do so by showing the behavior that we want modeled. 
harm is also inevitable. Sadly, it is impossible to predict every possible way a system could be misused. But we can preemptively set up guidelines about what to do when harm does happen. For this, you'll want an incident response guide. The A11Y project, a project I proudly help maintain, has one. Much like a code of conduct, it creates a shared set of expectations around what to do if an incident occurs. We require each maintainer to read through it and sign it, and let's read through a sample scenario. This helps maintainers understand how abstract guidelines can be applied in a real life situation. And you know, this really isn't about us as maintainers either. It's about the community that we serve and prioritizing their health and safety in a fair and equitable way. Speaking of community, one last little bit about villains. We don't have to be miserable islands of fear and resentment. We can team up. On this slide is the top half of issue number two of Marvel's giant sized supervillain team up featuring Dr. Doom and the Submariner. And on this slide is a villain addressing a room full of other villains from a podium. Hear my words, fellow villains. Alone, we may struggle in vain. Isolated, we may face stigma for daring to speak the truth. But if we band together, we can leave our mark on the world and show all those fools who dare doubt us. You've now all borne witness to my plan. Now it's time to take what you've learned here today, go forth and be the villain. I know this wasn't exactly the most fun talk, but I think it's an important one and hopefully you did too. Thank you for your time and for your attention and thank you to the interpretation services for their support and to DeQ for allowing me to have this great opportunity. The foundation for this talk was sourced from an article I wrote a couple of years ago for 24 Ways. I'll have a link to it as well as links to the other resources I used to make this talk included in the slides that are now live on Noticed. I'll also be linking to this presentation from both my personal website, ericwbailey.design, and from my Twitter account, at ericwbailey, if you do the whole Twitter thing. And with that, um, I'll happily try to answer any questions you have. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Eric, for your thoughtful and important uh, presentation here. And thank you so much for our attendees who have put in so many great comments. Um, I just wanted to share a couple here before we get into questions. So a couple, couple mentions of um, this was incredibly engaging and informative. Um, it's really nice to see somebody take this seriously and address it. Tech is not neutral or apolitical. Kim Graydon. Okay, so let's get into some of your questions. Um, please, everybody, if you have um, more questions for Eric, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. And you can also use the um, vote um, thumbs up feature to, if you wanna see a particular question answered. Okay, so uh, first one here, um, how would you raise awareness on those issues that people are somehow privileged enough to never have been exposed to those issues themselves will understand them as more than just an exception and take them into consideration when building features? Yeah, wow. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I guess, first of all, I'm not the expert here. Um, and I think a lot of this is highly contingent on the organization that you work for or you're bringing this issue up in and how receptive they'll be. Um, there may be strategies for intersecting with HR. Um, you also wanna be a little bit careful about that depending on what the issue is and kind of HR's role in the company to say that a little delicately. Um, I find that a lot like with disability testing, I think um, as much as you can making it personal, like if you can demonstrate you know, somebody using assistive technology, the same way you can kind of dis demonstrate this or simulate it actively going down goes a long way from like, 
oh, oh, I, I see now. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, I think there may also be like indirect strategies here, um, especially when you do consider what I talked about in the talk, which is the stigma about discussing these things. So how can you kind of, provided you have the organizational clout or ability, like how can you indirectly kind of start to stitch up some of these issues through feature work that may not be related? So like, I guess a really ham-fisted example I'm coming up with on the fly is if, like, if there's a bad input that doesn't have input validation that's allowing harm to come in in some way, you know, is there a way to phrase that in terms of like, well, this is just bad input, it's creating bad results, you know, this is a QA issue, and is there a way to kind of sneak that in and zip it up that way? Um, I think that's kind of what I have to say, but I do want to reassert that's a really good question, and I wish I had a better answer for you. Really a tough one, um, but but nice job. Um, here's a question from Meg. Um, in the agent scenario, uh, the report block export feature is in a kebab menu. How might you recommend making those options more visible to somebody who might not be as technologically savvy? Yeah, <laughs> I, I waffled on the kebab, but I used it for dramatic reveal. Um, I love just putting options up front. Um, you could definitely restructure the UI to have the primary kind of functionality. So entering the message and the send button as up front and top, and then slightly below, I think text labels are just fine for those three options. Um, the other thing I do kind of want to stress is like the, the, vibe of pushing those buttons because um, customer support in the agent's defense um, is terrible sometimes and somebody might report an agent just because they're feeling powerless and they pull like, you know, they smash that button to make themselves feel better even though the agent was operating completely on the, you know, on the line and like doing exactly what they should be doing. Um, I find that happens a lot with customer service jobs where people take out their frustrations on completely innocent people. So it's kind of a balancing act, I feel. Absolutely. All right, next question is, how do, how do we distinguish a design flaw from an abdication of responsibility or leadership? This person uh, says they're thinking about Facebook specifically and the platform's uh, growing role as a tool for genocide around the world. Yeah, I mean, you can quote me, like <laughs> Facebook should be scattered to the four winds <laughs> in its current state. Um, I mean, I think that's where you start to get into like, what is the role of government? What is the role of governance? What is the role of oversight and like legislature? Um, you know, Facebook has repeatedly demonstrated that it's unwilling to change. And so what compulsions will force it to change, basically? Um, personally speaking, I'm I'm shocked that after Myanmar, Facebook just kept on chugging and there wasn't a moment where they stopped. Um, so scaling that down a bit to smaller organizations with less scope than Facebook. How do you determine like what is oversight versus what is malice? Um, I think you need to think things through um, in that, you know, like a, a typo is a typo, but if you are not doing your job as a designer to think through like, empty state kind of configurations or error state configurations, you know, those are the kinds of things that I feel can lean to like subversion, which is like, if I don't consider these edge cases for normal design considerations and they're happening a lot, that's an indication to me that like, you need to reevaluate how design approaches this flows. Um, I do think it's a really prevalent problem right now in the design industry because we are so focused on shipping quickly that we do model only the happy path and like you're lucky if an error state gets thrown in at all. <laughs> um, so I do think it's a systemic issue right now going on in design. Definitely. 
Definitely, thank you. Uh, okay, next question. Um, what books or articles on this topic would you recommend? I know you mentioned a few in your presentation. Oh my God, yeah. Um, Technically Wrong is one. Um, the Internet of Garbage is another. Um, I have, they're, they're all in the slide notes. Um, a lot of this writing has actually been happening online. Uh, like Kat's spoken about this in a couple of different ways. Tragically, one of them is like as a result of speaking up about it. But um, I'm really thankful that she was good enough to share that experience with us because that's basically a post-mortem of what happens when your personal information is spread around the internet in abuse circles to create harm like strategically and kind of the learnings from that and what to do about it. And like, that's, those are the kind of things that like, I don't think they're really raw and I don't think they'd ever seen the time of day for a publisher. Um, so I really encourage reading that. There's another one from a support agent who is like, I don't use my photo anymore when I am on a chat service or like a chat support service because I'm femme presenting and it turns out people are terrible. Um, so those are the kind of things that like really I feel are eye-opening and definitely worth your time reading. Excellent. And you said these can be found in your presentation notes, is that correct? Yep. Um, Noticed has them and they're on the slides and then it also has a um, like a link share feature. So there'll just be a big old list you can click on and hit up. Super. Okay, next question. We have a few more minutes here. Um, how much has digital anonymity increased issues with subversion? How does anonymity affect mitigation of risk? Are hit me with heavy questions. I guess that's fair. This is a heavy topic. Um, anonymity online is a double-edged sword. Um, it can be a vector for abuse, but at the same time, I think it is very much required. Um, if you are in a minoritized population or you know are unable to kind of be taken as you are seriously, it provides a mechanism for being able to voice your concerns and your opinions in a constructive way and be taken at face value. Um, I think it's the same phenomenon as like, I'm a cis white heterosexual man and present that way. And I can talk about these things and be listened to and not questioned, but it's the same phenomenon as like, why do some people put their credentials in their email signature? It's because they need to put those in in order to be taken seriously. And so anonymity provides a mechanism where you can, you know, present the way you wish to be presented um, in order for your concerns to be heard. And I think this is especially important when we're talking about uh, digital abuse and subversion and things like that, uh, because it's a way to be taken seriously. That being said, um, how, where, and why anonymity comes into play is also like very variable depending on what you want to do. Um, you know, in terms of government, like with vaccine rollouts, it's kind of important to know who's going on and what's going on. Because again, you know, we've seen examples of people trying to scam the system and that's not great, but that's human nature. So it's complicated and I don't think it's a, a binary answer to a complicated issue. <laughs> I don't mean to sound evasive. It's just, these are really thorny things and I'm definitely not the expert here. Great, thank you, Eric. All right, well, we are right at time. Um, I wanna thank uh, Eric again for your extremely um, important and relevant topic today. Great presentation. Thank you everybody for joining this session. Um, sorry, we didn't get to all of your questions, but <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to thank the audience for your participation and your feedback and suggestions, especially on um, content warnings for the future. Um, and um, I wa wanna wish everybody a great rest of AxCon and thanks again for, for coming. <laughs>